Welcome everybody back to Siegel Talks here at the Martney Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center CUNY in Manhattan and Midtown, uh, which looks like a ghost town. Every second store is closed, empty, people moving out. You see people putting up uh, wooden uh, barricades in front of the glass or uh, businesses leaving. Um, quite a quite a, a dangerous time a difficult time as we know and uh, america now has over 150,000 confirmed deaths most probably it's many many more the ones we don't know that they died with the covid uh, uh, um, virus most probably 40 to 50 million people infected uh, these are the real numbers as suggested 10 times 15 times higher than uh, confirmed uh, infections. And uh, of course, theater has been impacted terribly. Uh, everything is closed. People are out of work. They will be out of work definitely till the end of the year, most probably till next summer. It's a catastrophe uh, for the field, for all of us. And, uh, and we have been talking for 18 weeks now to uh, theater artists from New York, uh, from the US and around the world from the globe. And uh, uh, this will uh, end this four months where we really talked every day with someone. We most probably were the only institution creating new content every day uh, during this uh, time. Um, Alex Rowe from the Metropolitan Player Arts said today, Frank, but it's not true that you're the only one creating original content, which of course is true. But um, I think um, we are the one who came out every day with something new, but of course, also it's not a production. It was not an artwork in that sense. So um, he's absolutely uh, 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 right about that. But we really uh, uh, got an insight in the mind of theater artists. And as we always said here, theater artists are close to the present, to the moment. They anticipate the future. They have been on the right side of social justice on the complex struggle for freedom and liberties. And now, if not now, whenever would be the voices of the artists of significance and importance. So it's a, a big deal for us that we were able to do this. We want to thank HowlRound again for being so generous and supportive. We do not take this for granted. Uh, our statistics, if uh, we can take a short moment to, to, to listen to that, we had 90 talks uh, with 143 artists from around the globe, from uh, 42 uh, uh, countries. Um, 143 of them, most probably 50,000 uh, people listened uh, to the talks. That's conservative judgment and people are still looking on it. So it's quite uh, quite remarkable um, um, for us uh, what, uh, what, we, uh, what we got into. We may perhaps were not fully aware of it, that we are archiving the future and also a field, a profession of theater artists and in that time of Corona and uh, and uh, here we go. With us, we had truly significant voices, leaders in the field, emerging artists, significant artists. And uh, with us today, we have as a, uh, as a returning um, 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 guest, the first one actually is Richard Schechner, the great Richard Schechner, whose uh, work in the field of theater and performance has been so groundbreaking, so influential, so significant as a practitioner, as a director, as a leader of founder of companies but especially also as a thinker, as a philosopher of theater. So Richard, it's a really great, great, great honor that you took time to come back uh, and perhaps also look a little bit at what happened. You were an early guest um, in these uh, months and uh, to have another look and, uh, at the theater. So really thank you for, um, for joining us. I normally say, what time is it? But I, my guess is uh, it's uh, uh, the same time as here in New York, but it doesn't look like uh, NYU where you are. No, uh, on Thursday, uh, Carol Martin and I left New York for a month and mm -hmm. we're in Hills, we're in New York City. We're in Hillsdale, New York, which is around 120 miles north slightly east of New York City in the uh, area near to Massachusetts, the Berkshires, a very, very beautiful area. I mean, actually, I'll, I'll uh, go out the window here. You can, uh, out the screen door, you can see oh, the mountains and uh, etc. cetera. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's an irony. And it really is the this irony. There are a couple of things I'd like to discuss with you. 
I do want to discuss with you your the the series, but I. Yeah, um, I think uh, Richard wants to discuss with us, but I think now for the moment um, we have uh, lost him, and uh, I'm sure he will be uh, come back um, in any minute. Um, it just shows the countryside maybe is not as stable in the internet connections and the and the cable uh, uh, um, connections as the city um, is here. Um, again, I would like uh, maybe to make a few remarks on on. Uh, on our series, on our talks, uh, uh, PAJ, the per Performing Arts Magazine, uh, decided to publish 30 excerpts uh, of the talks that will be coming out um, in this fall issue. So perhaps this will be uh, some material for students also to look at. It's quite interesting to see it in print, uh, what happened. Richard, are you back with us? Uh, we cannot hear you. Um, and uh, your sound, your sound is still off. Um, and um, maybe it's just me, uh, Thea, in case you're listening from HowlRound. Richard, your sound is off. You have to unmute. And I'm going to try to gonna write that uh, on a piece of paper uh, for Richard. Uh, and, um, and, um, And uh, well, listen, uh, uh, it's not so easy. You have to unmute. I'm unmuted, but oh, I don't here see Here you are. Here you are. We hear you again. Yeah, but you don't see me, and I don't see we you. We do see you. We see you. We can see I, you. What happened was that beautiful place I was. Uh, was uh, too far from the router and it disconnected. Uh, you well, see let's me. Let's go back, uh, Richard. You were saying, uh, sit down. Okay. Uh, I will. I'm. I'm going to try to see if I can get a picture because I'd like to see. Uh, I'd like to see what's happening here. How around? Well, no. Well, at any rate, I can't see you. And now you're looking at my kitchen. Yeah. And <laughs> uh, I'm going to try to, I wish I could see you. Uh, I'm going to try to just put a howl around and see if it comes in mm -hmm. yeah. and see if we come back. Yeah. Th there we go. Yes. Here we are. And uh, now he can see us, but we can see uh, Richard, but it will be just um, um, just a moment and um, will he get back to us. Um, so again, um, uh, Ben Gillespie uh, with uh, Bonnie Moranka worked on um, creating, I think, up to 30 excerpts from the talks up to June. So there are more perhaps uh, to come. And it is quite uh, quite interesting to see then what was spoken in words and in writing and the contributions from you know, Eugenio Barba and uh, and from uh, Tanya Bruguera, from uh, the contributions from all around the world and uh, how seriously um, theater artists are affected by this, but also um, how, how um, essential the questions are that have been um, posed um, um, to us. And Richard, right. you are back, we can see you. Can you see us? I can see you, I can hear you. Fantastic, yes. Now this is the kitchen. I'm going to stay here because this is Good. closer to. I need to get my notes and uh, uh, closer to to it. Good, good, good. Well, it's good that the kitchen is close to the um, patio. It's and closer to the router, and uh, I need to stay close to the router. Yeah. Okay. So sorry, uh, everyone, for the uh, interruption. All right. So what I was saying is. Uh, in looking and thinking about everyone you've had, this uh, situation is not an even situation. We know that in the United States, the death of uh, the murder of uh, George Floyd brought to our attention, to the attention of non-blacks, to the attention of whites, what has been there from the beginning of the settlement 
of this continent. That is that all lives are not equal. Some are much less valuable in terms of what happens to them than others. So it's not someone in one of your uh, uh, talks said, well, the virus does not discriminate. That's true, but the dispersal of the virus re reflects discrimination. It's like saying flood waters do not discriminate, but those who have a dam or a wall or do not get flooded and those who do not do get flooded. So this virus in the United States disproportionately affects people of color, especially African-Americans who remain uh, even more, what can I say, discriminated against, fenced in, segregated than let's say some Asian-Americans, uh, some South Asians and so on. It still is a distinct uh, community and uh, uh, we have not paid reparations for the slavery. Perhaps the only other group uh, uh, so devastated or so uh, oppressed, although things are changing, we hope, have been uh, Native Americans who uh, obviously, uh, this is a settler country. So if we go back to say, what are the settler nations of the world? The uh, New World, North, Central and uh, Latin America represent the most recent uh, settler uh, uh, occasion, or not most recent, but the most uh, egregious, uh, or it's hard to use most, terrible situation of a settler nation and settler places. We're not gonna change that. In reading over what uh, has happened, I saw that there's the, the differences between the people who live in the have places, the people who live in the have less places, and the people who live in the have not places. So I think one of your contributors from Burkina Faso said, look, uh, you're talking about this virus. We lose more people to measles. We have the Boko Haram. We have uh, a, a number of, uh, of problems. This is, not, this is not our most important problem. Uh, because we have other plagues and have had other plagues. Uh, someone from India uh, noticed the uh, 600,000 people, workers, who were uh, made to leave Delhi because uh, they know they had to shelter in place. They didn't, their wages were such that they lasted only a day. And they were starting to walk. Uh, 500 kilometers, 1,000 kilometers, 1,500 kilometers. And then they had to return, a, a turn around because there was no way for them to get to where they were going. And they were told that they shouldn't be on the road. I don't know what's happened to those people. That was back in uh, April, I think, or maybe May. And we're now in July. I do know that from friends of mine in India, the situation there is grave and uh, perhaps even more underestimated and covered up than in the United States. So we're, what this crisis, one of the things that's exposed, uh, I will talk about the positive, but on the negative side or uh, on the X-ray of social situation side is that the world has not been globalized in any kind of way which suggests inequality. It has been, uh, it, the, the virus has exposed the inequalities. So even the fact that I'm sitting here today and you're there today, you're in the Siegel Center or wherever you are uh, in, in New York, I'm in upstate New York, we're in fairly good circumstances, represents an enormous privilege. So that you may have a 500 or 1,000 or 5,000 or 50,000 people watching this uh, but there are of course 6 billion people on this planet and enormous numbers of them uh, uh, suffer uh, doubly. They suffer from the uh, pandemic uh, or triply. They suffer from the pandemic. They suffer from the economic and uh, consequences of, of the pandemic when things uh, shut down. And they suffer from the previous endemic pandemics that continue to uh, plague them in the literal sense of plague them. 
so that this reminds us of how far we have to go. I mean, it doesn't, it, it, it would uh, and in a certain sense depress me, but it doesn't depress me, but it does tell me, it does show it is a kind of spotlight on the inequalities we have. So some of us can worry about, will people come back to the theater? Uh, how much online performance will we be able to do? Can we teach uh, university seminars uh, through Zoom? While other, others of us, us being the human species, still wonder, am I going to eat tomorrow? Who is going to die of diarrhea in my family? How can I get out of this horrid refugee camp, which if the virus comes here will take, infect 80% of the people because there's no, no chance to do social distancing. You can tell me social distancing is like telling me drink only clean water when there isn't pure water. So that this has really uh, the George Floyd incident, uh, the George Floyd murder was a kind of uh, synecdoche. It, 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 it intensified, it showed uh, what is there to be seen. He's not the first uh, and uh, unhappily, nor is he the last uh, black person to be killed by police, to be killed by state violence. But we have the instruments now to actually watch this. And, it, and seeing these things uh, repeated is a kind of uh, snuff film pornography, as well as a way of, of uh, raising consciousness. In other words, I am myself so ambivalent. In other words, when that video got played again and again, I literally covered my head. I, I, I didn't want to see it again and again. And at the same time, I know that you go on to places in the internet where such videos are played as entertainment, literally as entertainment, as celebration. And so what our, our instrument of uh, communication have given us is the ability to see the full range of uh, human behavior and human feelings from the very positive ones that Frank, you represent and that so many of the people who came and spoke uh, on your uh, a series represent to uh, actually horrific actions that people uh, celebrate. The, you know, that we learn that genocide is not an infrequent or past event. It continues to happen. And it happens, uh, you know, uh, systematically because of the inequities we have. So the question, uh, questions are raised, uh, are we capable of, uh, of uh, remedying, of changing, of moving forward. It's not that the human uh, species, that the human race, I hate to use the word race in relationship to our species, but you know what I mean, Man, humankind is, is capable of uh, deeds of angels and deeds of devils. And, and we're constantly performing both kinds of deeds. So that this period to be makes me aware as I've not been aware you know, for so long, maybe ever, of the, of the breadth of the human experience and uh, that it is uh, 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 as, as damnable as it is uh, blessed. And that we, we see that uh, 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 occurring. And what will we, what will we learn uh, you know, uh, from, from these events. Uh, when the uh, holy grail of the vaccine comes, where will it go and what will it mean? So a vaccine comes and I assume that many people in Western Europe, Japan, South Korea, uh, North America, uh, and even there, uh, the question is, will the uh, people in, uh, you know, the uh, uh, wealthier people get this vaccine first, even in these places? Will they go to equally to uh, Turkish workers in uh, uh, Germany and uh, African-American uh, 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 ghettos in the United States uh, as they will go to uh, uh, people like me? Uh, 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 so, uh, uh, and after the vaccine uh, uh, 
is, is available. It, even now, uh, you know, there is a vaccine for measles. And as I said in Burkina Faso, children are still dying of measles uh, uh, and, uh, and AIDS is still uh, uh, ravaging parts of, of Africa, South Africa particularly, and, and not necessarily the white uh, remnant in South Africa, but the people of color there. So these things are, how do we react to them? I'm, I'm going to kind of asking you, because you sat and listened you know, it, it does raise the question of what is the function, of what, what can artists do? We can record these things. We can, uh, all right, let me put it in another way. When Euripides wrote Medea, when Shakespeare wrote Lear, were they doing anything that helped the world? Uh, or were they saying, this is the way the world is, and for those of you who have the leisure or the privilege or can get into the Globe Theater or sit in Athens or down through time, you can learn about these things and we can kind of have our jaw drop. We could be astonished by them. Uh, uh, but do they change anything? And, uh, you know, I wish I had an easy answer and say, yes, art matters. And I, for me, of course, it matters. And for you, it matters. And I think for most of the people watching, it matters greatly. Uh, uh, and maybe artists are not there to address these uh, incredibly uh, difficult social problems, which we now see much more nakedly than we saw before. And the virus exposed it, not only because it exposed everyone's vulnerability, but it also exposed how that vulnerability was met in uneven ways by, by uh, different societies. So what do you think, Frank? I mean, what do you think about that, having listened to this, the, the role of the art and the, and the, uh, the social structure that uh, uh, this uh, virus has exposed and, and actually your own fact series, which shows us so much good work uh, is it simply that we continue to do good work and we, we accept the human uh, condition as it is and slowly, slowly ameliorate it if we can, recognizing that perhaps we are not deeply living better than we lived a thousand years ago. Some things are better, some things are worse. Is that the way it is? Or is, there, is this story of progress a true story? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's the, um, it's the big question. And um, listening to all the um, artists, um, many of course said art is important to me and that's enough. Uh, I'm a human being as it is for someone to paint, as it is for someone uh, to uh, be a farmer, to be a father, a mother, to be a lover or to be a, a writer. So they, that is, uh, we don't care so much. Other people say it's important or not. Abhishek, who you also mentioned in India, he said, um, well, we do work in small places, but I get censored by the Indian government. They don't care about the TV and they don't care about the movies, but our plays get forbidden. So it must have an effect, it must be important. So maybe we should ask them, you know, so they obviously, it, um, uh, it, it, it uh, highlights something as you said, it produces something, but it, it, is, it is such a deep question. And uh, as you also said, you, just yesterday, we had uh, two artists from Lebanon who said, uh, for us, it's now about uh, survival, about food. Uh, we have electricity for two hours a day. We cannot even get the money out of the banks. The American dollars, they might have the few ones are no longer allowed. And even middle class families will are starving or won't have don't don't have the access to food. It's collapsing, and uh, so how can we even think about art? But they say Dima said yes, but we do, and uh, we think of strategies. It's uh, who we are, and um, I think what emerged from the talks, and it is deeply moving. It is uh, uh, inspiring, and it's also part of what is real. Uh, symbolic and uh, not just imagination, but part of imagination is that what these artists do is representing the very best of life. 
if there is a, a functioning community, a functioning city, a functioning society, theater is functioning. A great city has great theater, it's the reward, great sports. And if it's not, there is no theater, it's forbidden, it doesn't come out, you don't see great theater. So, um, so at least theater in that way is a celebration of life. Uh, so many talked about what it is about of getting together. Gertrude Stein said that, you know, half of theater is you call a friend, you make a plan, you have a coffee before you go in, then you talk about it, what they say. And then you say, it was so lovely to see you and uh, go home, those they connect. And the other half is what they show. And so I think what it did show is that the deep experience of life, you know, as the Russian uh, uh, critic, a now thinker, I now can, will come to me in a second from the 30s, who said, you know, when black is black, a stone is stone, hate is hate, love is love, you experience it. And so the deep experience of life next to uh, inside, you know, our inside, but something that comes from the outer, perhaps theater is the, one of the closest, and that's why we miss it. But I think, as Brecht said, first comes the, the fressen, first comes the eat, food to eat, and then comes the morals and the ethics. Yeah, but, but the, you know, there there is where Brecht is wrong. Mm. Uh, and this, because uh, uh, I've been to places where people will, uh, particularly in relationship to religion, to what they deeply believe, they will make great art in the service of their belief Mm -hmm. before they will put food in their mouth or despite putting food in their mouth. I've seen it in India again and again. So there's this fabulous music. There are these processions, there's the performances. And these are very, very poor people who dedicate, you know, who, who make these things. So it's, it's the question of uh, when uh, theater, not just theater, but art itself becomes uh, sui generis, becomes art for art's sake, becomes itself that you, you know, what, what happened uh, in the West uh, with the Renaissance and then it, uh, uh, it, it continued through the Enlightenment and now, you know, the, the idea of the art of the theater rather than, uh, or, or, or art itself, whether it's a stained glass window or a great piece of music or movement or dance or chanting or, 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 or theater, when it was uh, a part and parcel of the uh, 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 belief system, the civic system. So even the great theater of Dionysus that we uh, you know, take in the West as the origins of our theater, mm -hmm. not the origins of all theater for heaven's sake, but the origins of, of, of Western theater in Athens in the fifth century BC, it was a civic celebration. And those who were citizens all attended. Yes, the women did not attend and the slaves did not attend. Mm -hmm. They, you know, that's the, I don't know if we therefore should destroy the statues of Euripides and Sophocles and Aeschylus and all because they obviously supported a society that uh, uh, sustained slaves and sexism of a profound kind. Uh, and we have to ask, uh, having supported such a society, how do you write plays like the Aristia or Oedipus with Yocasta or Medea or Phaedra, you know, so that the women did not participate at the political level, but obviously emotionally or in terms of the tragic imagination and in terms of agency, who has more agency than Clytemnestra, uh, uh, you know, and how she uses it is the way she uses it, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, uh, the, the at that at that point and through the uh, again in the European Middle Ages and in many places in the world now, these great arts are functions of deeper systems of social commitment. So this is one of the things I did uh, feel from uh, listening to uh, forum and from getting what I got from uh, the TDR editors. Uh, Fourteen of them responded, and it'll be. Uh, published uh, in early September in, uh, in TDR, um, that there is a renewed sense of theater in particular, but art in general as part of a social fabric. That social fabric may be familial, that social fabric may be communal. There's, uh, uh, you know, these uh, dances that go viral and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, the the, the rapist in my way that that video that went is seen by millions began in uh, uh, Buenos Aires, I believe, or, or in Chile rather, and then moved all, all around the world. So that these this 
uh, uh, machine that we're using, this computer that we're using is a way of creating a, a community. So we, we are hungry for, and I think we are uh, uh, to some degree returning to that sense of community. So I, I think of small uh, places in New York. So let's take Dixon Place, for example. It's a small the theater, it's down in a basement. It's in the former Lower East Side, I mean, still the Lower East Side, but it's been gentrified mm -hmm. to some degree at any event. So let's say they can't pay rent and uh, they're out of business, but Dixon Place will not be out of business because they can find another place. In other words, these smaller uh, places that exist kind of uh, without huge uh, uh, commitments to uh, ornate 19th century proscenium theaters and et cetera, they will, they will find a, a way to return or to continue partly online and as people begin to assemble and people will assemble again in, in place. What's really uh, threatened at the present moment, and it's an interesting threat, are the larger establishments, you know? How long will it be before you can put 1,200 people to watch Hamilton uh, and get that budget together? How long will it be before the Metropolitan Opera comes back, etc.? cetera? So uh, the, the smaller places, which are in a certain sense uh, uh, like opportunistic insects, that find niches will will they continue and they'll and and they will they will come back because they don't need the uh, terrific uh, resources at the larger ones and they form a different kind of community when you go to these smaller places you are seeing people that you see again and again at the, the same you know the Marvin Carlsons of the world who go to everything or a lot of things so you you form a certain kind of community that is is hopeful to me that that kind of community will uh, persist and, and, and even thrive. The question then remains though, how are we going to uh, address the large uh, structural social changes? And I don't know if it's the job of uh, art to address them, uh, except as Brecht did, except as the Greek tragedians did, except you know to call as Chekhov did and Ibsen, to call attention to them. Uh, uh, at the end of Death of a Salesman, uh, Linda says, attention, attention must be given to this man. And it's, it, it, she's kind of speaking for the playwright, for the artist, simply to pay attention is an act of, of, of living, of life, an act of potential change. Whether we can as a, 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 a global group really raise ourselves from a uh, poverty, raise ourselves from injustice? Uh, I don't know. It may be that the human enterprise is a, is a vast cosmic game of whack-a-mole. You knock down this injustice and that one pops up over there. You knock down and someone pops over there. Maybe that's the way it is. I'm uh, old enough to have that slight uh, taste of despair about it. But maybe there is such a thing as, as progress. You know, uh, Steven Pinker would argue the, in the better angels of our nature that given uh, statistics, we're living in a peaceful age, that a, a smaller proportion of people are hungry, a smaller proportion of people are dying in wars, et cetera, et cetera. The absolute number is greater because the total number is greater, but the proportion is less. That indeed in, in much of the world's history, most people's lives were nasty, brutish, and short. And now at least we have, uh, there's some progress in that. I, I don't know, what do you, what do you think? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I, I, I kind of begin to know what I think, but what do you think from listening to all of these artists? Do you think that we're moving in a, in a healthy direction or do you think it just is a, a kind of a cycle? Mm -hmm. Well, in a way, I on one level, on way I would agree. I do think that um, uh, extreme poverty or extreme hunger, except for sub-Saharan uh, Africa, most probably in this world, is no longer as prevalent as it was. Um, there is a better access to education for women, girls uh, going to school, but it's a long, of course, a long process. Um, numbers of uh, solar energy uh, uh, that is being created now, by far by far outstrips what even Al Gore promised in the you know, late 90s. It's, a, 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 it's incredible in that sense what, uh, what has happened. And, um, and we also need um, 
to, to recognize that that numbers, you know, I am from Germany, a country that is so peaceful and also tries to lecture people on democracy and they're doing a great job, you know, but they caused two world wars with, I don't know, 40, 50 million deaths. And we don't live in that time. I'm the first generation of over 250 years where there isn't a war on the ground uh, in Germany. So we like to look at this as progress and we like the idea that Germans now do it real as they did all the other stuff with the best <laughs> Kaiser the best Weimar Republic, the <laughs> yeah. best fascist, the best genocide, best communist, you but now they are the best, we are the best democracy, but it is hopeful. And there is a line that led to this and we, we hope and think that it is um, um, part of a good intelligent design that it's what is good prevails uh, ultimately. I think theater artists, and I think you are right, um, theater artists in a way have to call attention, uh, make visible, a change and Bogart said here on the talks, uh, quoting physicists, the mere act of observation changes reality. That what she yes. that's what she uh, quoted uh, from uh, nuclear physicists. Uh, I think uh, yeah, that's part of the indeterminacy yeah, principle. Yeah. Yes. That you that by the way of doing, and people do observe, people do think, people do point out, and numbers are uh, uh, larger. I think uh, I like to. What Yago Rodriguez um, 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 said that uh, he said when Anna Akhmatova uh, uh, tried to get to see her son who was jailed by the Soviets and she went every day to see him in prison and you had to wait for hours. Someone said to her when she was in the middle of them, isn't that Akhmatova the poet? And people said, yes. And the woman said to her, will you write a poem about this? If you do, I'll let you in front. And she did. <laughs> You know, and he said, this is a, uh, it's something, this is a function. That's why he does theater. And, um, and so I, I do think that uh, the contribution um, is um, important. It is uh, significant and- uh, But when we come out of this virus, mm -hmm. do you think we will come out and, you know, now there's the movement of Black Lives Matter. There are people in the streets uh, we uh, in the United States hope that the uh, presidency of Donald Trump will come to an end, though he's mm -hmm. now talking about not having an election. Yeah. Heaven help us. But do you think that when this is over, we will go back to business as usual as quickly as we can, or we'll take the lessons that we've learned and apply them, that there will be, you know, a move towards greater social equity, not only in the United States and in the uh, uh, highly developed world, but uh, collaboration uh, uh, among uh, the nations, that we will come to grips with climate change to some degree, you know, to uh, uh, move away from fossil fuels and all that climate change will uh, bring to us if we don't attend to it urgently? Or do you think once this, you know, is our, is our memory such? Is our, are we like in waiting for Godot? Once, once pots of unlucky leave, they don't know, okay, that's over. What do we do? Nothing. They do not move at the end of that play. You know, Beckett, you know, we can say Brecht is one great teacher and Beckett is another. And Brecht is the great teacher of social amelioration and exactly what you're saying. Look, observe, pay attention the street scene, see what is happening, etc. And Beckett says, you know, life decays, uh, uh, entropy, it goes uh, down. Uh, people have very short uh, memories. Once you do give a, a little bit of relief, they forget about the pain and particularly the pain of others. You know, who looks at, at what Lucky suffers in waiting for Godot once Lucky and Pazzo have left? So which is it to be? Or are we, as I feel, always in a tension between these two visions, you know, between the tragic comic of Beckett and the uh, political hope of Brecht, you know, uh, which, uh, and, and, and we have the followers of both, or, you know, between Aristophanes and Euripides, if you will, or, uh, uh, you know, one could get many, many examples. Uh, I feel that uh, that we contain it. We contain multitudes. We contain it all. Uh, 
if 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 indeed we can end poverty, but to end poverty in the long run, we have to control population. You know, you can't. I, I hate to bring these things up, but the world only had two billion people in it 75 years ago. Can you imagine? Uh, 75 years ago, it had one third the number of people that it has now. So that's, you know, Malthus. Uh, uh, you go, the population grows geometrically and the resources grow arithmetically. And so that the question then is, uh, yes, we can end poverty if we can level the number of people. We can't just constantly uh, add, add, add people and so on. And I do think that art shows us this. And I think that what has happened in this, uh, uh, in a certain sense, terrible moment, but also a magic moment, is how much people communicate. So you're doing Siegel talks. A year from now, will you do a second set of Siegel talks when the crisis is gone, where people come back and and, and and see what issues remain that we have to address. And if you did a second set of Siegel talks in 2021 or 2022, would you have the same amount of listeners or does it always take a crisis? And then when the crisis is over, we kind of say, okay, let's, we'll just go back to whatever the new normal is or the old normal, but over the long run, what's happened is a kind of uh, increase in ability to solve problems coupled with uh, emerging new problems. <laughs> in other words, mm -hmm. People didn't have to worry a thousand years ago about water pollution. There weren't enough people to worry about water pollution. And water pollution just happened to be human shit and some animal shit and so on. Very take of a, you could deal with it organically. It wasn't kind of heavy metals. It wasn't the results of industrialization. It wasn't radioactivity. So even as we progress, we produce more uh, yin and yang, the other side of the progress. So that, that's, the, that's the thing we have to grapple with, that, that the sense of crisis and comradeship that we have now, how can we maintain it and really make for some fundamental uh, changes? Are we capable of that? That's, that's what I really would like, uh, like to know. I, I would hope that we are, but the evidence is not, uh, uh, it's not all in yet. Um, mm. We'll see whether there'll be Siegel talks two years from now. That will be a big, big uh, indication because what you're doing under this pressure, which is so glorious, many people are doing in their own way, uh, including the people in, this, uh, in the streets, including the pressure for you know reparations for uh, increased education, including the movement against Donald Trump, including the sense that democracy is being threatened not only here but in Poland, in Hungary, uh, in, in uh, Germany has a new uh, rising fascist party. You talk about good things about Germany, but there's uh, forgotten whether uh, something for Germany. That party is uh, not as uh, small as it was a few years ago, and uh, uh, throughout Western. The Europe, there are these anti you know, there's Anne Applebaum's uh, new book on the twilight of democracy, interesting book. Yeah. So the question then is, how can we continue this fervor, this goodness, this comradeship, this sharing when we have the vaccine? Mm. Yeah, yeah. These are, uh, these are important questions. They are important observations, important concerns. Um, many, many answers. If, I think if theater is of interest, of course, it's because it's a model for something. What do you see? And yeah, so but they're different theaters. I need second is model. Is the, the model end game? Or is the, is yeah, the no, let me, let me like, what you see on stage for a tiny moment, your own VR set, your head, how you perceive the world, which also is a composition. It's a dreamlike composition, what we perceive our reality. It is perhaps shattered. And this model should reflect the change that is possible, the new ways of producing new forms of theater, like Emilio Rao talks about the outside the theater, collaborative work, it's less of hierarchies. Uh, sharing ensemble, what you did, ensemble work, um, that it goes right. away from a central figure. So what you see reflects a new way of uh, representing things, yeah. the idea of a Rimini protocol or what Carol works about, the theater of the real, that people are in the center 
of it, whatever, the quote unquote, the real and the, the normal uh, people. It's a, it's a humongous change from the genius playwright uh, the, the author Miller too, saying, we, what are you thinking? I mean, we had Adelheid Rosen from Amsterdam and she goes on her bike with her team, goes to a neighborhood that is complicated, rings doorbells and talks to you and say, we would like to do a play about you in your apartment with seven others, uh, you know, on the same time, people will go around and we would like to learn from you. So that's radically uh, different, but it represents, uh, I think, a different, uh, a different approach. James Simpson, um, a literary scholar, I think, is Harvard about English uh, uh, literature, who said, more than that book, which I like, Permanent Revolution, it takes 150 years for a revolution to take place. If you look back, that even Calvinist revolutions in England, early England, they were puritanical, they were intolerant, but ultimately, beginning was the beginning of form of liberty, libertarian thinking. And so perhaps also democracy with Hungary and Poland and all that problems, you know, is going through phases, but ultimately, hopefully that revolution uh, will, will, will happen. And it did. And he said, revolutions happen when actually something has already changed. It is not as much the Black Lives Matter, which of course is the presence, or as Roncia said on Monday, he said uh, that these people are like artists. People are on the street imagining a new life, a better life, different models of life. That, um, that these uh, 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 people you know, contribute to change, but something has already changed for them to come out. And this is why something will happen. In Germany, numbers of that right-wing party are actually down. Trust in government compared, of course, in difference to the US is much, much higher uh, than before. And Jeffrey Sachs, uh, the great economist on Colombia, who says, well, we could feed everybody. Everybody could have a basic income. There would be enough food. Maybe not the best, but everybody could be. The planet can sustain it. It's no, there's no political will of sharing. There's no political uh, idea behind it. And we have to change that thinking that it, it is for young Germans or young Europeans, instead of buying the big car, they think about having a great bike. They pay three, four, five thousand. But the change, you know, where like in Germany, where the Mercedes is like the biggest thing in life was to get the car. You could own this machine. That was the vision, the dream. And now people say, no, I want to have a bike. Yeah, so it's a fundamental change that's slowly happening. So I do think why theater is important and the theater of a Milo Rao, of a Thiago Rodriguez, of a Castro, all of that is, they are different models of producing and experience life and the okay. theater shows it. And we show, and we, we, we reflect it with the call to action. That's about the spectator, you, it, are also in the center you're participating and as we see now if there are no spectators it doesn't exist and it perhaps wasn't as clear you know i, I agree and you know uh, decades ago i began to do theater outside of regular theater spaces yeah. outside of the proscenium and so on and what you're talking about about ringing the doorbells you know augusto boal also did things of this sort with the uh, forum theater and uh, the spec actor and so on and so forth. So it, it's there. The question then is also, however, in socioeconomic terms, will Broadway come back and be what Broadway was or uh, similar to that? Will mm. they still have these huge things? Yeah. Will Hollywood or Bollywood, uh, you know, the, the, uh, and the uh, uh, filmmakers or will uh, 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 Mark Zuckerberg and uh, uh, Jeff Bezos, you know, there are the, we're talking and you're talking and it's great about small players doing mm. great things uh, because we can find, we're kind of like uh, the cockroaches of the society. We find a crumb here, a crumb there, we survive, we make our work, we do it, we ring doorbells and so on. At the same time, there are these large structures which are uh, productive and oppressive at the same time, you know, so that oh, at the same time that we're socially uh, uh, learning and socially distancing, perhaps we're doing more shopping on Amazon and not less. So Amazon is kind of like the anti-bike bicycle, right? So what happens to the small store owner who depended on you to do something now that Amazon does like that and without any danger of uh, of uh, the, the virus getting to you because, you know, it'll get to the messenger who's delivering it, but not to you. Or when uh, the Schubert theaters come back or when, 
you know, it may not be Jeffrey Epstein or, or whatever his name, you know, the other guy in Hollywood, but it'll be somebody else in Hollywood. So what happens to these larger structures? Uh, I think that's one of the crises in American democracy. In other words, what you're saying is true, but also the alt-right is, is also highly, quote, mobilized, literally. You know, there are yeah. like 350 million guns in the United States, some mm -hmm. enormous number of, of, of weapons. And, and these uh, uh, groups are also organized. They also use the social media. They, they use the same tools that we use and they use them uh, with a large number of people. I mean, uh, yes, Donald Trump may only get 40% of the vote, but 40% of the, of the vote is a, a, an enormous number of, of, of people. Uh, so, uh, you know, so the question for me is that this is ongoing tension and ongoing dialectic. And I would like to see some big changes made in the large structures as well as in the small structures, uh, and and that is very hard to hard to envision, because I don't see the uh, uh, I, I don't see the energy that I see the energy there to survive and thrive in so far as we can. Mm -hmm. I don't see the energy to survive and thrive and really overturn the social structures, uh, so that we have a, a new way of a new way of living. So that Amazon is a is truly a public corporation, or or whatever it could be. Uh, so that the Broadway Broadway is is it not only has new modes of showing things, but its whole uh, infrastructure has changed. That Hollywood, uh, you know, we not only have indie films, but some of the larger film, you know, the things that go to Regal Cinemas or wherever are also changed. So these these are these are questions that I think we need to. Uh, mm -hmm. need to think about and, and, and work on. Uh, I was thinking one last thing, I know I've talked a lot here, but one last thing is that uh, I was thinking about the word revolution. So, and, and at my age, you think about these things a, a little bit differently. And I say, do I, do I really want an armed revolution? When I was younger, I would say, you know, uh, we, we uh, revolution is a revolution. You know, the French had it. Uh, the Russians had it, uh, you know, they, they went out and they killed people and they changed the government. The czar is no longer there, although I don't know, Putin seems to want to be a kind of czar. Uh, but do, when we use the word revolution, are we really talking about reform? Uh, I mean, when, when people like you, like me, do we really mean reform or do we mean revolution in the uh, uh, Che Guevara, uh, uh, Lenin, uh, 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 way of revolution, even George Washington, you know, they, they took up arms. And I personally no longer feel that taking up arms will lead to anywhere except for a, lo a lot of death and the, and the reestablishment of an order that will be perhaps different, but in certain oppressive ways the same. Maybe different people will be oppressed, but you know, if you look at it from another planet, it'll still be one group of humans oppressing other groups of humans. Uh, reform is something else again. I like the idea of, of uh, new structures and reformations and what you said about it taking a long time because you talk, you know, I like the idea of the Newtonian revolution or the Einsteinian revolution. You know, these are ways of changing modes of thought and they, uh, over time, they they change the whole way the world uh, is, 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 is uh, apprehended and the way the world is made. So those kind of reformations, I'm very much in favor for. Armed revolution, I think is a chimera. It doesn't really get us what we think it will get us. Uh, you know, the Russian revolution did not get the Russian people what they expected. I don't know, Mao's revolution seems to have gotten the Chinese a lot of what they've, they expected. So there's a, a, a case where it seems to work though. Uh, many of us may not want to live in Xiaoping's China. Uh, but of course, the, the number of people that were lifted from poverty there is an e enormous proportion of the, of the population. Even in, in my lifetime, I, when I first went to China in the early 1980s, people were living in caves. I saw, you know, the change has been extraordinary uh, at the expense of freedom of expression. 
uh, at the expense of some Ai Weiwei's kind of thing, at the expense of what's happening in Hong Kong. But perhaps that's not such a bad trade-off for those people. So, you know, it, it's also tolerance of different systems of governance uh, with it, within a certain, certain range. Maybe uh, democracy is not the mode, popular democracy is not the mode for everyone at every point of social uh, development. I don't know. What, what do you think? That's a good uh, good question. You know, the question is, is democracy for rich countries, you know, who have uh, the means and to do it? And maybe it, it, it takes a takes a while. Many uh, changes started out, as you say, with violence. Some people argue the 68 civil rights movement was successful because of the Black Panthers who were organized right. disciplines and they brought change. But actually the peaceful uh, Mahatma Gandhi, which did bring change in India, but it, so that it is the exception um, um, of um, of the rule. I think uh, things, as I said, might have already changed. American movie uh, theater uh, uh, companies are struggling. Their theaters are empty. They only make money by selling the drinks. Someone found out about this. And they hired a Netflix uh, executive and who said, you know what, to have people pay $10 a month and let them in for free, but they're going to buy drinks and stuff. And you, that's the only way you're going to make money. And that's what they did with the gold movie pass. And within, a, I think, a month, 10 million people or 5 million signed up. And, uh, but it was nobody thought of so many people would come. Um, but um, it has changed. Uh, Warner Brothers and Disney will release films online now because the movie theaters are closed and they have been problematic anyway. To have to get there, you have. You yeah, know, but will the people will so the people start changing. to own Warner Brothers? Will the ownership shift? Will the will the Schuberts, uh, you know, no longer run the Broadway theaters? Will the question, yeah. Will the structure who own the ch change? You know, I mean, if you go now to the Broadway theater neighborhood, you don't see Broadway theaters uh, pr producing masks, engaging with the neighborhoods, you know, uh, supporting people, having food kitchens. They don't. I think people will remember. And one would also argue that they always have been part of the entertainment that perhaps is closer to the donuts and the, you know, the sugary food. It, it's not healthy. It's not uh, eco, eco food as what we like naturally organically produced. It's not good for our bodies and our brains, what they have been putting out. Even so, a lot of it is fascinating and they provided work and still do for so many people and so many artists. But right. the question is, will people really miss it? Will people miss the Yankees when they're told the biggest thing in your life is when the Yankees win the World Series? They are your family. We all have, they are not. They are not there yet. You know, they are, they are Broadway theater, everything is, they are not there and they are not supporting it. So I think what we look at is what brings change. You know, so many people in the talk talked about Joseph Chaikin and the open theater, a right. small company very few people knew about it. You know, I, in Germany, I didn't really hear about them, you know, but the influence was tremendous, what they did and how they changed minds. And, uh, and I think in the bigger picture, these small places are like homeopathic pills that perhaps in the big body have a resonance. We don't know, we will never know, you know, but I think- well, I, I, I agree, they do have a resonance, but they are also to some degree kept in their place. So that, because the very nature of getting larger means you change your structure. I mean, I knew Joe Chaikin quite well and the open theater. And, you know, he left the living theater to form the open theater to investigate acting. There were a group of them and his sister Shami Chaikin and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Jean-Claude Van Italy, the playwright and so on. Now, if they had become like the group theater, successful, and moved to Broadway and ended like Elia Kazan and uh, you know uh, Marlon Brando, you know, and and the Actors Studio and Lee Strasberg, mm -hmm. they would have become something else again. I mean, Joe wanted, of course, he died young and tragically. I mean, he had a heart condition. He didn't, but uh, I don't think he ever would have wanted to be successful in that other sense. And I think you're quite correct. His influence and his the waves and also the Living Theater, their influence. Are, are, are vast. We see them all over the place. Uh, and maybe that's the way it should be. Maybe it should, we should have a quote class situation in the arts where there are the large structures, you know, uh, that, that uh, 
uh, occur and then the smaller things that occur and, and then some get absorbed into the larger structures. The visual arts are very interesting in that way. You can sit around a long time and then get absorbed. I mean, Vincent van Gogh was of course a, 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 a tragic outsider figure and then he's in the Louvre. Uh, Andy Warhol uh, was a pop artist and then did the factory and then he's in the uh, uh, Whitney as his show, you know, uh, because the visual art remains. The theatrical art, performing arts, not film, but the live theater is ephemeral. So you can't save it. You can't, you can't say, okay, now Joseph Jakin belongs at Lincoln Center because there isn't any Joseph Jakin. There isn't any open theater. There's a, some video. Buy, yeah, and we cannot buy your Dionysus in 69, you know, as a collector. Oh. Go back, say, this is an early work of Schechner. I'll pay a million and I own it. It's not possible. Yeah. That's the fundamental difference, you know? Correct. And, and that's a healthy difference, yeah. but, it is, but it is a structural difference. So maybe what we're talking about is, you know, Mao once said, and he probably regretted it, let a hundred flowers bloom. And the French say chacun a son goût, you know, so that the, those are two kind of classic statements of classic liberalism. In other words, that multiplicity and diversity and difference is, is healthy and good. Uh, at the same time, we know that when uh, we have a, a quote free market, it isn't free for very long and the bigger players get bigger and bigger and bigger. That seems to be part of the human nature at least enough of us are greedy and skillful mm -hmm. that the it may not be everybody it may not be uh, even most people but the you don't take too many people who are skillful and greedy to accrete wealth and power and then to keep it uh and, and every once in a while i mean i think this was the function of the american revolutionaries in the 18th century they said you know you have to break that and 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 start again so that's what i mean by reformation maybe you have to break these power structures. We, uh, when, the, or when Rockefeller got too big in the end of the 19th century, they had uh, uh, trust busting. They started to pass laws. You couldn't hold all these things. Now they're trying to you say, is Amazon too big? It's an Amazon after all that. Should it be broken up? Should uh, uh, Facebook you know, be broken up into multiple uh, social media things? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have the answer to that, but I do think that that uh, the multiplicity is good and too, too big is not so good. Yeah, yeah, I think this is definitely, uh, also depending on one thing is not good, what we learn, uh, right? right? They have to be uh, independent, small units um, that, that do work and the question, yeah, of the 100 flowers, the, the argument, the other one is, um, you can cut those flowers, but spring will still come. And the question is, are we in that spring, even if things are cut here and there in Hungary, Poland, Trump, is it still coming? And I would say, yes, I am uh, in that sense hopeful. I think that um, mankind does remember uh, in a good way, it just might take time. Talking about the American Revolution, the slavery project also by the New York Times and others very clearly also said that uh, the American Revolution, one of the reasons were that the British said, we're going to end slavery. <laughs> and, uh, and that this, lots of states, especially the Southern or others who were very, very loyal to the British, they said, that's not possible because uh, as I guess Ted Cruz said this incredible thing they, who said, what well, was a necessary evil? No, Tom Cotton said that. We needed oh. slavery as a necessary evil. It's a shocking, uh, racist, uh, supremacist statement a week ago or like two days ago, but they said the, the American Revolution, which always was a transatlantic revolution with the help from France, you know, only because the Amer French fleet, naval fleet finally uh, intervened, uh, uh, also helped the Americans uh, to win and they gave large loans. But the idea of that revolution was also to put a wrong reason perhaps, next to all the good reason that were also part of it, as you said, the contradictions the uh, we all uh, live in. And I yeah. think- I mean, the, the uh, absurd contradiction that Thomas Jefferson can write all men are created equal and hold slaves. I mean, uh, yeah. he wasn't an idiot. He, he, he must have known what he was writing and saying that he could not uh, live up to his own ideals. Yeah. So, and he didn't free them all upon his death. He freed, uh, freed you know, uh, yeah. his wife, but he did not uh, free her son, uh, others. 
So the contradictions are right there, you know, in, in almost all of the world's great myths, whether it's the Bible, the Ramayana, you know, these great myths have contradictions at their heart, uh, that, that, that people are going in uh, two different directions, that they're, that they're no, no, one, no one is perfect. You know, as Hamlet said, you know, thinking makes it so. The very fact that we think means that we imagine great things, but we can also imagine and do horrific things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, that, that is true. I think why theater is significant, and I remember once uh, Basil Jones from the great handspring company talked about it. Well, use of puppets, he said, you know, you, he did Wojciech, uh, no, Ubu and the Truth Commission, and he said, uh, it was hard. To, uh, by the way, he always would say, "We use puppets because puppets can say things, and censors <laughs> don't get so upset." You know, right. uh, and we do use comedy and we those human relationships. Even in the times of apartheid, and our contribution was significant. It helped to change. People came to see our work, and we got away with a lot. And the fact that we could do things uh, was meaningful. But Basil Jones said that. Uh, um, you could represent things um, that were normally not possible, like the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. How do you really do that? That's, you know, paintings try to, it doesn't really work, but you have people moving a puppet. The puppet seems alive, but the person is hiding. And uh, you don't, for a moment, you're irritated as a spectator. What's going on? You know, or boom, right? what's, what's real? What's not real? He said, for a short moment, as Heiner Muller said before, look, between looking here and there, what really happens in our brain when we look from one moment to the other? So he said, but this could fracture that and it is an opening and all of a sudden you listen and you spend some time outside your normal VR system. Our brains are not different than we are machines. That is, a, you know, I think a minor that the German philosopher uh, who, who writes about meditation and the ideas of his group mystics to to experience real reality or the acts or the, the divine? Uh, he says this for centuries. Uh, philosophers and um, people, holy people, have tried to access that, and that theater perhaps is a way for that short moment uh, to question what we perceive as reality. As you sit there, and uh, Richard Foreman once said that, you know, we don't see our heads, you don't see your head, you see your body, but it's your right. head that processes the world. Yes, but but we, now, we think it's objective, but it's not. We, but what now, we, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah now yeah, you see it on Zoom, that's true. That's a big difference. Perhaps that's why we are listening to each other. But he said, you know, so what we see with our head is a VR set. It is creating a reality that is dreamlike. With our neurons, we process it, and we think this is true, this is not true, and we are not aware. This is what Jung and uh, Freud, what the school told us, when people hated when Galileo said the world is actually, or the Earth is not the center of the world. When uh, 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 Newton who said it, and Darwin who said, we are all from the apes, and then Young and Freud who said, we are who's governed by our subconscious, and we are not able to understand that we are not able, but for a short moment, we understand that we processing things, and that we are a little bit questioning that uh, for a moment, and in that way there, um, there is a chance, and it's one of the few, few ways to, uh, to understand that perhaps we do, uh, process reality different and that the idea is to be aware that we are processing. We will never get out of the Richard hat, the Frank hat or whatever, but we are aware that we are processing and theater teaches you that. And I think this is uh, uh, why it is important now. And what I hear from all these artists who say it's, things are so complicated, Guillermo Calderon in Chile said we were on the streets in December. Police right. were shooting at dem demonstrators, they shot about 800 students, he said, people, the eyes out intentionally. And then the same police is now saying, shut down, don't go out, we have to protect you. Or yesterday, right. no, you know, millions of people, two million at one time, were on the street, almost a quarter of the entire population. And then they had to go home. You know, so, um, so to deal with, with these things, to live in the contradictions we have, I think, and not to 
go to fast answers that Trumps of the world who say it's black or white, it's right or wrong. It's all easy. They are lying. They are lying to us because they do not look like theater at the same thing from a different uh, way. Michael Frame, the great playwright said, if you have a great play, everyone is right. That's a great play, you know? Right, right. Well, I think you said it very, very, very well. And we live in this immense complexity. And during these, this period where we've been uh, uh, forced one way or another, either internally or externally, to isolate ourselves, to communicate in a new or different way, or not really new, but more intensely using these means of communication, to be careful and aware when we're out. You know, part of the thing about going out in the streets is you look at people and you say, uh, are they safe for me? Are they not safe for me? And you kind of do this kind of uh, dance it used to be, at least in the New York streets, that you maintain your anonymity. You know, you plowed through, you kind of had a channel. Now you kind of look this way and you look this way. You wonder who you're with, who is next to you. Do I want to be on the same si side of the street as that person, as this person? So all of this is a kind of marvelous hypersensitivity. Uh, and I would love to feel that when the vaccine arrives, and I'm using the word vaccine metaphorically as well as actually, in other words, when we are no longer threatened by coronavirus, or we feel we're no longer threatened, will we be able to maintain the sensitivity to others that we now have? Now that sensitivity involves avoidance, but once you have sensitivity of avoidance, you can also develop sensitivity to contact right? Mm -hmm. It's sensitivity that's the important thing, whether you use it to stay away or to come close. So will we be able to, once the uh, metaphorical vaccine, once we're not afraid of that virus, will we now, we now look at a stranger and we wonder, is this person safe for me or not? Will we be able afterwards to look at a stranger and say, can I, why not hug this person? You know, I used to stay away, now it's safe to hug them. Will mm -hmm. we be able to accept that kind of thing. Will we be able to create our communities? I agree that the theater, the live theater, I mean, I like the media too, and I, I like mixed media in the theater and all of that. But what happens in the live theater, and especially if you are uh, dis, uh, out of the seats to some degree, I mean, even in Shakespeare's day, the people in the pit were standing there. It was like a mosh pit. They were not sitting yet. Mm -hmm. and they were outdoors, so they were moving and they were doing it. So I would like to see the live performance, like performance art, be much more interactive. It doesn't have to be fully participatory. It doesn't have to be Dionysus in 69 or Then She Fell or, uh, you know, uh, things like that. But, but it, it can get involved uh, and bring people in, uh, in, in more active ways. Now, now, now that we're doing it virtually, will we be able to also do it actually? And uh, I would like to hope that we, we will be able to do that. Yeah. And we don't know really what the world will be like in a hundred years from now. I mean, I've warned about, I mean, a lot of people have warned about climate change and the consequences and so on. But what, one thing we do know about history is that the projections usually don't happen I mean, <laughs> because of the reason you say, we imagine one thing and we begin to make something else come into existence. So uh, uh, I think a hundred years from now, uh, what we thought will happen won't really happen, it won't happen, it won't happen in the same way. And, and what artists do, they, uh, they uh, not only can see the future, they can imagine what can be constructed. And that's what you're saying too, this life of the imagination this notion that what, what goes on in here and out there are interactive, and I create the out here as well as the out here creating the in here. And we two together and whoever else is out there watching, hello and participating, uh, we're, we're creating new realities even as we uh, uh, sit here and talk. Yeah, and I do think where people also agree everybody more or less said this is a very serious moment it is what's confronted us with uh, death it's a hinge. It's a hinge. 
and it's changed. They say, everybody says things have already changed and things will be changing. Of course, a lot will be trying to go back, but this cannot take them back. We are animals, someone said, I forgot uh, who it was. We realize we are uh, an animal, you know, we, that our skins all of a sudden are like state borders where we say we don't want to let people in and our skin all of a sudden is the outside border to the world. Something come in, we desperately don't want to have this invisible uh, virus. Uh, to 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 uh, uh, to um, infiltrate us, and uh, so we forces us to think: Who are we? We're not. What? What? How are we defined? And uh, let me uh, just uh, just finish. So the idea that comes out of this is: This is the first time the West, after perhaps World War II, experiences uncertainty. Everybody, as you said, in Burkina Faso, said yes. Well, from malaria, four hundred thousand people die in Africa of malaria. We know that. I can get it and die. I have it actually once a year and just hope it's not the bad one. And um, that this uncertainty, that understanding that we are animals, that we have bodies, that we are vulnerable, life can end with a bad head handshake. That's what Tyler Mack said, you know, it, he, he knows people that my friend survived AIDS and now died by Corona. You know, so this is unheard of. We did not know that before and this uncertainty, this is something that really really has changed how we think. And uh, uh, Frédéric, uh, we too, too, who said, who works with Bruno Latour, who said, you know, this is now clear that uh, he, they look at the virus and, and medicine and medical research as theater too, said this is an actor. The virus is an actor. We are on a big stage. This is the general rehearsal. We cannot screw this up. And, um, but we are no longer at the center. I think the big uh, I thing that might come out of this, and they hope that this is this critical zone, 10 meters or 30 feet below Earth's surface and 30 feet above, what makes life life. We are only alive because plants are alive, we are alive, we keep producing life. He said, this is uh, um, endangered and we have to understand that we are one part of it, that there are plants who are significant to our lives, that community is significant. What happens in China in a fish market affects our life and that we have to collaborate and that we have to find ways to survive. Otherwise our species, as you said in the beginning, is endangered and to look at this as a theater and whether it's under the microscope, uh, under the electronic microscope, or whatever, but to say this is something, and there has been what perhaps literary critics said early on that the decentering, you know, the deconstruction that we are no longer, as Galileo said, the planet Earth is not the center of the universe. Perhaps this now teaches us we are not at the center. This is also the big lesson, and perhaps theater and art helps us to get accustomed with that idea that and that's okay and that it is not a bad thing we do not be afraid of it and that we have uh, have um, uh, possibilities you know there was the concert for plants in a in naples in an opera uh, that uh, you know french artists one we spoke to you know from um, from Montaigne, who said we have animals and plants are part on the stage toshiki okada's work other, that represents a new way of thinking and that's important that we see that. Right, it's a new way, but it's also a very ancient way. It's, you know, uh, I'm thinking of the Ramayana of uh, Valmiki, which was written around 2000 years ago in which uh, Rama, you know, is the uh, incarnation of Vishnu. His allies are monkeys and bears and mm -hmm. uh, who, who obviously speak, Hanuman is the best known so that it's kind of a respect for the non-human uh, world. Uh, uh, and then in the Bible, uh, the flaming bush that uh, uh, Abraham sees and the voice comes from the flame in the bush. So that it, in a certain sense, uh, around the 18th century, 17th century, the industrialization and the idea of mechanization and that the world belonged to humans and that we could take down all the forests so we could build machines. And, you know, when you see a movie like uh, uh, Fritz Long's Metropolis, the imagination that he had of what the metropolis looks like, and our imagination would be a place full of trees now. I mean, we, 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 we don't want to imagine a metropolis 
completely devoid of, of, of that kind of nature and only what is uh, manufactured. So that, uh, uh, you know, I think these are getting back to uh, a kind of balance. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that we're insignificant because we think. And uh, cogito ergo sum is uh, true to some degree. But we are not the be all and end all. I mean, when I get out of New York now uh, uh, in this place that I am and I look out and I see thousands and thousands of trees, I'm happy for that and want that to uh, continue. And I do think that the theater reminds us uh, uh, of, the, of the fact that we are part of the great chain of being. We are not par apart from it. We are part of it. And we can... Uh, manage some of our comrades on that great chain of being to some degree, but we also have to really, really carefully and deeply and lovingly respect them. Yeah. And so many um, artists have said, well, actually I do gardening. I have some plants. I'm watching a plant grow. Right. Exactly. You know, because of, uh, Miguel and Gloria uh, from the, the Spider Woman Theater, Native American, who said, you know, she said, you know, I get my hands into the dirt. I talk to the trees. Uh, it sounds very simple and, you know, but she said, no, this is of real importance. That's what we should be doing, connect to. And she also said, which I liked, uh, I think it was Miguel, that we are in a creational myth. That's what she said. All the stories we used to hear, which are story story, but they're all true stories. That's why they are significant. Yeah. What happens in there can save our lives or destroy our lives if you listen to it. Which is now we are in a new one. There's the Mad King, there's the plague in the country, people have no work, people are starving, people are dying. How do we react? What do we do? What is the right thing to do? What is moral and ethical? I remember you talking about Antigone. I mean, you talked about taught lawyers and uh, theater artists together to say, you know, what, what's law? The written law, what's human law? What did Antigone do? What is the right thing to do? And she came up a lot, Antigone and Galileo, those two plays were mentioned quite often, I would say. Mm -hmm. that, that, did that surprise you? Would that surprise you or? No, it, it do doesn't accept that their stories finally are not happy ones. So I hope, you know, that uh, we don't end up in a cave walled up or uh, convicted of uh, heresy. So, uh, so well, that Rao changed it. He's changed the ending. He said he worked with the indigenous artists. He said they sold, told him that that's not a good idea. To, and he said, okay, we'll change it. He right. was in Brazil when he had to stop it, you know, and, uh, and, um, uh, well, what, hmm? go ahead. I'm just saying, I think what you've done is uh, changing the world in uh, some significant way. This, uh, this opening of these dialogues. So I do think that at least, uh, I know we're getting near the end of time, uh, of our time, uh, 120 already, but I think that you should do this not for three months a year, but for a month each year. You should, you should say that this is the first Siegel talk, mm -hmm. uh, talk series, because I think what you've done in bringing this uh, wide community of people together and, and uh, you know, uh, from uh, Ranciere to the uh, people from uh, Palestine, the Burkina Faso, you know, this uh, very uh, wide group of, of people is an enormous service to the theater and beyond the theater, to the community that generates the theater. So there's human gardening as well as uh, botanical gardening. And mm. uh, you're a great gardener, a great human gardener. Thank and you. I think that the Siegel Center is, you know, uh, a significant farm uh, in the middle, uh, you know, right there in the middle of New York City. So, uh, and you're the uh, you're you're the gardener, you're the farmer. So I I hope that this is not uh, a, a crop for one year, but of course you run the Siegel programs, so that has been going on for quite some time. But I mean, the idea of Siegel talks mm -hmm. should kind of annual or semi-annual event, uh, maybe each time uh, organized around a particular uh, crisis or opportunity, you know, because the virus will pass, we will get the vaccine, but it's not the last thing that we're going to be facing. You know, one on, on global warming, 
would be very interesting, uh, you know, how, how art is going to attend to that. Uh, uh, the return of nuclear weapons, you know, that's another very serious thing that's happening, that the United States is, quote, upgrading its nuclear arsenal, which is kind of horrendous to think about, upgrading it for what purpose? And that uh, we have been saved these last 60, 70 years from global wars, but we've had many, many, many little wars, and we have not had the use of nuclear weapons. Hopefully we'll never see them again, but as they proliferate, as different countries feel that they have to exercise their macho-ness, the uh, chances for that happening uh, increase. And that's another thing we, we, we have to deal with. So these are intersections between uh, large issues that confront humanity and theater and the arts. And I think you're in an extraordinarily powerful and good position to help us work through it with a community of people, as you have done. Well, thank you. That's uh, this is a so generous and, um, and, and thoughtful. Too. So really, it's accurate. Thank you. That's a big, uh, that's a big deal and I'll take it. And uh, that's I mean, it's really, really, it does, does mean a lot um, um, to me. Um, as you said, we come closer to, to, to the end. And I, I know that you also, you prepare for your great TDR magazine. Um, on the more on the scholarly side also um, um, reactions from around the world from around the globe so we are in a way not the only ones but it perhaps was more the focus on practicing artists but what do you what it could also be you know a Stiegel talk series you know the voices this we believe we are the university we believe in thinking we believe in theory we believe in you know models uh, to whether then they work out or not but that's not the but we need we need those. This is of significance. Um, but so, what? What? What is the? What came out of the, the contributions? You said 15, 20 people sat down and. Right. Well, I did. I invited the TDR editors, yeah. all of them, so that the TDR contributing and consortium editors come from various parts of the world. Now, of the twenty-three or twenty-four of them, of uh, fourteen contributed, so they. They range from uh, Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet uh, to Joseph Roach, uh, uh, Carol Martin. Uh, many contributed. Uh, I mean, I can't sit here and, and summarize what they said, but they uh, gave examples of uh, performances. They gave uh, philosophical takes on what the future is going to hold. Uh, both uh, Tracy Davis, who was a historian, and Joe Roach look back at earlier plagues and uh, Tracy is talking about the first use of masks in uh, China in 1911 where the flu was just beginning and hadn't gotten out in the world yet and uh, uh, Roach uh, talks about the uh, great plague of London uh, you know uh, in, in the 17th century which killed one-third of the population and then we have this uh, 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 many uh, uh, examples of current perform current performances and so on. It's a very interesting take because what you've done, which is so important, is this conversation. And then you're editing uh, Sarah Lucy and her comrades and you have edited for Performing and Arts Journal. Yeah. And uh, that's going to be very interesting. What we've done, is, is, it exists first as writing and uh, so that they've, they've had a chance to write it. But we both chose to organize it when publishing in the same way, in a date way, because the earliest uh, published uh, is the earliest received, because what's happening is unfolding. What's happening is happening in time. So in that sense, the coronavirus situation is a theatrical situation. It's a narratological situation. It's, you know, it is theater, but it's actually a broader genre. It's the genre of the story being told. And the story has a beginning and a middle, and we're moving towards the end. We're not sure what the end is. We uh, pretty well know what the beginning is, and we're in, still in, in the middle. It's also what Victor Turner would call a social drama. In other words, it begins with a, cri a, a, a breach, which is the escape of this virus, a cri uh, uh, the, the, the virus jumping to human beings, and then the crisis when the virus gets out into the world, and then the redress of action, what we're doing now which is how does it get dealt with? And then the end of a Turnerian social drama is either a, 
a, a, a reconciliation or a schism. So a reconciliation would be the va- what I'm calling the vaccine, some way of resolving it, of moving on. And a, uh, a, a schism would be if the virus uh, morphs, the vaccine doesn't work, we have to live with this continuously. It's constantly moving forward, which uh, is uh, horrific to uh, uh, consider as a possibility. I don't think that will happen, but it is uh, happening. I mean, one of the things that I see philosophically with the virus is our belief in progress. In other words, the deep human belief in the scientific progress, there will be a vaccine. The laboratory is working on it. We're testing. There will be, in other words, we, we take this as a natural occurrence with a human solution, right? Uh, it's not going to run its course. What happened with the 1918 flu is they had no vaccination. It ran its course uh, and uh, several hundred million people died, a huge proportion of the world's population. And from 1918 to now, that's 102 years, human faith in uh, human knowledge and science has exponentially e- e- exploded. In other words, we are terrified by some of our knowledge, namely certain forms of genetic engineering, the possibility of nuclear war, uh, global em- emissions leading to global warming and all of that. But we also celebrate it. We are confident that the Abbott laboratory or some other laboratory will get something that'll put in our arms and this virus will go away. You know, uh, not quote herd immunity, which is an interesting uh, uh, term because you read it and it's about animals running together. You listen to it and it's like, I hear about this immunity. I can, it's heard, I can, it's, 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 it's a kind of urban myth that, uh, you know, we can do it. So all of these things are operating t- together. And I look at this, you know, from my performance studies point of view as, as not so much theater as a huge performance. In other words, theater is part of performance. I mean, I think of theater as a very precious particular genre involving actors and perhaps stages and playing roles, but performance is larger. We're playing social roles. And, 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 and we're, we're acting it, I agree, it's to perform, acting it out as a, as a human species. And we have great faith. We have great faith. We're like Faust. We have great faith that we can find the solution. Uh, and hopefully uh, it will have a happier ending than the first part of Faust. In the second part, he, he does okay, right? He does okay and goes around the, he goes around the world. Yeah. Yes, I would say perhaps I think, I think Faust would be a great, uh, I did once a Faust play, but mm-hmm. Faust would be a great story to do in this period because it's a Faustian kind of thing we're involved in at this moment, yeah. it seems. Yeah. That's, a, that's a very good. Yeah, yeah perhaps, and some suggest he actually was model on Alexander von Humboldt, you know, who you know, challenged you know, uh, the world's uh, idea that it all comes from Athens. And, and he said, also, Faust means fist, so you know, it matters. <laughs> it matters, yeah. And that perhaps Faust too was the first uh, post-traumatic work before Hans T. Lehmann, you know, was anywhere in the series, that it was a, a you know, no, very loose structure, never finished. started working it early on, never finished it. And uh, perhaps it, because of that, uh, in that post-structural way that there is no post-structure, it is closer to, to reality. This is a, that's, a, that's also, it's a good, Good idea. So maybe you might uh, include it in your uh, uh, in the work you are working on with uh, next to Mary Bloom and uh, Joseph Conrad. There might, now might be. But I did a Faust. I did a thing called Faust Gastronome, in Faust. which Faust, Faust was a cook. But the idea of his and the and the Mephistopheles was a woman. So it was like a, a, the bargains he made and so on and so forth. Uh, um, yeah. At any rate, yes, but I, Faust is a, I might include, it's a fabulous story, so. It is a great story. So Richard, really, thank you, thank you for, um, for spending time with us and for, for, for sharing your thoughts. And it's as important, thank you. Thank significant. You. thank you for listening. Thank you also for asking. And normally I would say the lineup for next week. <laughs> uh, and we don't have one, uh, so, um, but it is good to think about. And yeah, and so the question is, 
how should that go forward? So anyone from the listeners have idea, email us, you know, it's easy to find also you, but that's a good suggestion perhaps to do it over a month and to rethink it and to uh, structure it around themes. We'll, we'll have to see, it has to be meaningful and also part, part of a change mail perhaps, you know, one of the thoughts we have is, you know, to be part of a great theater festival in New York, you know, that we represent all those voices with this outside that also represents these new forms. Perhaps as Morgan Jeunesse said, what Joe Papp would do to go back in the parks, find a way to engage that the people that should be in the center, yeah. You should have a, a festival of multiple kinds of performance. In other words, rather than like under the radar, it's like all in public, but mm -hmm. some is in the street, some is in the theater, some yeah. is in home, some is live a lot online, a kind of a multiple theater festival, a very good idea. And this might be an idea for a Seagull Talk month here to talk to a lot of people, say, how would that look like? And Avignon Festival was founded after World War II. There's a clear reaction. It's the great festival in the world. Also gives identity to a city and a life and it's a joyful celebration in the sorrows of life, as Buddhists say, so really a joyful celebration people did say that as the last thing i would say uh, is what uh, i forgot you know what a lot of artists did mention is it is a time for them to connect to the inside uh, to the inner world i think it was krishna murti who said early on what he was so worried about the computers who came up said but it's the inside that matters he said it's not what comes from the outside Yes, it's also about what's inside you or Jung who said the only thing that hasn't already happened. Buildings have been already built. Uh, plays have been written, music have been done. You just, even if you look, it takes a while for the brain to process, but if you dream, it's immediate. No one has seen it and you are the writer, the stage designer, the director. You know, you put it all together, but that's who you are. And they said that people said this was a moment or is a moment to connect to what is significant. It's the inside and everybody, especially the big corporations, say it's not important. You know, the Yankees, the movie theater, the Broadway plays, that's more important. And it is also, but in the inside also, I think perhaps this time is also a contribution to, uh, to get closer to that and listen to it and to the ancient wisdom as you as you uh, said from India. So Richard, really, really thank you. And I hope we continue and it will be a con ongoing conversation. Thanks to HowlRound really, Sia for getting up uh, every morning before 9 a.m. in Los Angeles. Um, you know, it's an unholy time for everyone who works in theater and she does for VJ to be so supportive right away of the idea. I called him, I think on a Tuesday and then the next week and Monday, the first talk happened and that they were so open though flexible, said this is part of our mission. We also need to get out of the kind of American context. We have listened to voices from the world. So it was a big uh, contribution for us and it was a privilege to talk to everybody. So Richard, again, thank you. Thank and, you. and thanks to all the people who talked to us, who took their time, put their thoughts in there. Were, some of them were heartbreaking talks. Some of them are very inspiring talks. I think, as you said, it reflected actually the world we're in and uh, the, the kaleidoscope. So it was a, an enormous privilege. So thank you and thank you for our listeners. Yeah, we are a little bit over time, but it's the last one. I hope we will get away from it with it from you. And thank you for listening. It is important to listen as we listen to the artists, also for you, the audience. It is about you ultimately, what changes will happen, will you implement in your life? What can you learn from artists' experiences, what they teach us, what they say, and this is of real importance and to take action and also to be someone who creates an authentic change in ourselves in order to, to change the world. And if there's anything we learned in this year is we really need change. Forms we have don't work. they are old forms that might have worked some time ago, but no longer enough energy comes out uh, and as they should, have been. and only new forms then who are close to the time we live in will will um, will uh, create that. As they, someone said about Woodstock, it was the same concert today wouldn't have that effect. So we have to find what is it that helps us to reinterpret life, to be give us a vision. And I think theater can do that. And we are we are we are looking at it, and it's an experiment, and it's a laboratory, and um, and works like from Richard who did it as a th theater director and as a writer and as an editor and a teacher. This is a, a shining example of how we 
we can live our lives and uh, be part of change. So thank you so much. And thanks to everybody. And I hope uh, in whatever way and form, we'll see you soon again and uh, or see you Zoom. And uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Stay all safe.